Hi everyone, welcome back. In this section we're going to introduce the concepts of curl and divergence for vector fields. Now if we think about the main theorems that we've introduced so far, fundamental theorem of calculus from calculus 1, the fundamental theorem of line integrals and Green's theorem from this chapter, what they all have in common is they relate the integral of a derivative over a region with the integral of another function over the boundary of that region. And this word derivative I've written on the notes here with quotes around it because the derivative kind of depends on the context we're interested in. For the fundamental theorem of calculus it was a straight-up derivative. Uh, for the fundamental theorem of line integrals it was the gradient of a potential function. And for the uh, Green's theorem it was this mixed partial, so dp dy minus dq dx, so it involves some partial derivatives. But we'll just lump all of those things under this generic term derivative in some sense. And that's what I want to extend. I want to extend in this section this idea of derivatives to scalar functions, to vector fields, and see what we can do with it. So in order to start this off, we're going to introduce a formal operator here. And so this del symbol is just used to represent this vector of differential operators. So partial derivative with respect to x is the first component, partial derivative with respect to y is the second component, and partial derivative with respect to z is the third component. Now these aren't functions. We call these operators because what an operator is, is it takes a function in and returns a function out. So we call this a differential operator. And under this notation, we can start to revisit some things that we've seen before. For example, the gradient of a scalar function. The gradient of a scalar function, we can just think of it now as scalar multiplication. It's take your scalar function f and scalar multiply it to our differential operator del. And that becomes del f del x, del f del y, del f del z, which is our gradient. So we can think of this as a scalar product. So I'll write scalar product here of our differential operator with our scalar function f. And what it does is it returns a vector function. What this scalar product does is it gives us a way to think about the gradient. Now we can extend this. We can say, what if we have instead of a scalar function, a little f, what if we have a vector field? What can we do with that? Well, why don't I take the dot product of it with my differential operator, del. And when I do the dot product, what that does is it takes d dx and multiplies it to the first component of the vector field p, so that becomes dp dx. So that's our first component there. And then, since I'm doing a dot product, add it to the product of their second components, that's dq dy, add it to the product of their third components, dr dz. And so this is another kind of derivative we can have. This is like a derivative of a vector field. And we're going to call this one divergence. So this is called divergence. The previous one was called the gradient. This is called the divergence of a vector field. And it gives, and it's coming from this idea of we've got this formal uh, uh, vector, which is a differential operator, and we dot it with a vector field. Now, if we think about what else can we do with two vectors, two three-dimensional vectors, I can take their dot product. I could also take their cross product. So that's this next one. If I take the differential operator and cross it with a vector field, then, and just do the formal cross product as we would, we get this object down here, which is now a vector field. And that is what we call the curl of the original vector field. So here, this takes in a vector field as input, and produces a vector field as output. And the vector field coming out is some kind of derivative of the original one. 
Now when we say derivative, what we mean is really some sort of measurement of a rate of change. And so in this first context, the scalar product or the gradient, this is a measure of the change in the scalar field. We're going to think about what gradient was. It was a vector that pointed in the direction of maximum change and the magnitude of it was the maximum value of the directional derivative. So this was all about how f changes at a point. What is this next one? This dot product which gave rise to divergence. So what is the divergence measure? Well it turns out that this measures the expansion and compression. So expansion compression of the vector field f. And this last one, this cross product or curl, what does this measure? This measures rotational change in f. And to just sort of make these things a little bit more concrete, just to give you a visual for what we mean by a measure of expansion compression, we've got a vector field. If we think of this vector field as maybe just a velocity field for some gas. So we've got some gas particles that are moving around and, they, and the, um, the velocity vector field is telling us at each point well, which direction the gas particles are moving in and what their velocity is. Then the divergence is measuring whether you know, a little uh, volume of gas as it moves in the direction that the velocity vector is, is uh, pushing it in, is it expanding as it moves in that direction? or is it compressing as it moves in that direction? That's what the divergence is measuring. What the curled measures is, you know, as this gas is sort of moving, is it rotating at all? Is at thinking of it as a solid body, is it rotating as it moves in a direction? So it measures the rotational change. And so we're measuring the expansion compression as it moves and also whether it's rotating. And so that's what we mean by these derivatives because derivatives are all about rates of change how one thing is changing relative to another thing. And when we're talking about higher dimensions, there's lots of things to measure change in. How does this quantity change in relation to this quantity, etc. So these are just some different ways to talk about rates of change in the context of vector fields. So there's one last differential operator. We call it the Laplacian operator. And it is this one here. It is the dot product of del with itself. And so we typically refer to that as del squared. So this is del squared f, which is del dot del times f, which is just the sum of the second partial derivatives of f. So that's just another measure of some change of a scalar function. So we're going to be focused on the first three, gradients, divergence, and curl. So let's explore these notions of divergence and curl a little bit more in depth. So this in this box is just a definition of the curl again. So let's get to some examples. We want to find the curl of each of the following vector fields. So this can be written as curl of f or in terms of helping to remember how to compute it it's del cross f which is i j k del del x, or d dx, d dy, d dz, and then our vector field, negative x, negative y, and 0. So we can go ahead and work out this, this cross product. And now it's a, it's a formal cross product. We're going to do the differential operator. When we do the multiplication, the differential operator gets applied to whatever function uh, it's essentially being multiplied to. And so for the first component, we get the y derivative of 0, which is 0, and the z derivative of negative y, which is 0. So the first component becomes 0. The second component, it is the x derivative of 0, and then plus the z derivative of x, which is 0. And then the last one is, we are basically, for this last component, we are saying it's the x derivative of negative y, and then minus the y derivative of a negative x. Both of those are 0, 
So we end up with getting zero as our curl. And so this is telling me that the curl of this vector field is zero. And so in some sense, there's no rotation happening in this vector field. So we call this vector field a non-rotational vector field. One way to think about this, and I've got this little paddle wheel over here, is if I take this paddle wheel, there you can see it without a background behind it. If I take this paddle wheel and I just let it sit on, I'm imagining now this is a, a bunch of liquid, so fluid um, flowing around, and this vector field is the velocity field for this fluid, so it tells me which direction the fluid fl is flowing at that point and how fast it is. Then putting this little paddle wheel in the water, it'll move with the vector field. But if it starts to spin as well as moving, then the spin of it is detecting rotational change. And so what this is telling me, the fact that it's non-rotational, tells me that if I have this paddle wheel sitting in here, and it flows along with the velocity vector field, it's actually not going to rotate. It just will stay in the same position it is, just translate along. There will be no rotation. That's what this zero curl is telling me. Okay, let's have a look at the next example. So we're going to find the curl of this vector field. And so that's going to be I, J, K. We will zoom in on it a little bit. And that's D, D, X, D, D, Y, D, D, Z of negative y, x, and 0. And so this cross product becomes, maybe we'll help ourselves by using a bit of visual, so we'll cross out that column, and the product is the derivative of y, with, uh, the derivative of 0 with respect to y, which is 0, minus the derivative of x with respect to z, which is 0. So the first component is 0. The second component we get by the derivative of 0 with respect to x plus the derivative of y with uh, derivative of y with respect to z both of those are 0 so that becomes 0 and then the last component is the derivative of x with respect to x plus y with respect to y so that's 1 plus 1 or 2 so our curl is 2 k hat and so what that means is that there is some rotation happening in this vector field. If I put my paddle wheel in the vector field, it'll start to move around, but it'll also spin. What direction will it spin? The two, in some sense, is telling me some measure of how fast it'll spin. We're not going to get into detail on that. But the k hat is telling me that it's spinning in the positive, with a positive uh, z component because of the two. So by the right-hand rule, it's going to be spinning in the counterclockwise direction. And so this paddle wheel will move around the vector field, but it'll also spin in the counterclockwise direction. So let's have a look at the next example. The curl of this vector field is i, j, k, d, d, x, d, d, y, d, d, z, x, negative y and 0. And much like the one directly above it, when we take the cross product, we get 0. So this is another non-rotational vector field. And lastly, we can take the curl of this one, and that's again i, we'll zoom in a little bit, i, j, k, d, d, x, d, d, y, d, d, z, and that's uh, 0, x, 0. And so what do we get here? The first component is going to be 0, the second component is 0, and the third component here is going to be 1. So you get 0, 0, 1, or in other words, k hat. And so that's telling me again that it's going to rotate in the clockwise direction.
this time with some speed related to the, the number one. So maybe half the speed as the one above because it was 2k hat, whereas this one's only 1k hat. Okay, so there's some examples of calculating the curl. Now one thing we notice is that in a couple of cases they were non-rotational. We've got the curl being zero. Can we say anything about when the curl will be zero? I'm going to give you a bit of a hint here. If we look at this vector field, is this a conservative vector field? Is it the gradient of some potential function? Well, I need the first component to be the x derivative of whatever function I write down, and the second component to be the y derivative. And I can see that negative 1 half x squared minus 1 half y squared. I'll have to move that bracket over, y squared. That is a potential function for this vector field. So it is conservative. Okay, maybe that's just a coincidence. Maybe it was conservative and, and its curl just happened to be zero. Let's check the other one that had a curl of zero. In this case, this too is also a conservative vector field. And there is a potential function for it. And it turns out that this is a general result. If we have a conservative vector field, then the curl of it is always going to be zero. But more than that, if we have a vector field that's defined on all of our three, and the component functions have continuous partial derivatives, and the curl is zero, then it has to be conservative. So there is this tight connection between having a curl of zero and being a conservative vector field. In other words, these non-rotational vector fields seem to be precisely the ones that are conservative vector fields. And that's what our theorems are telling us here.